New technology called virtual fencing is catching on in Idaho and the West. Virtual fencing works like an invisible fence for pets, but at a much larger scale for livestock management. I feel like it's going really, really good. It's been super beneficial to the way we run our cows, and it's um, given us so much information on how our cows are on the mountain. Well, my wife's happy. My cows are doing good. Uh, the range is managed well. The forest and the BLM are happy and our calf weights are up and the market's good. How do you do any better than that? Jay and Cheyenne Smith run a cattle ranch near Salmon, Idaho. In partnership with the University of Idaho, the Salmon Chalice National Forest, and the Bureau of Land Management, they have been using virtual fencing technology to manage cattle on spring, summer, and fall range. The project really shined in allowing the Smiths to graze cattle in the Diamond Moose allotment one year after the massive moose wildfire. After the moose fire, standard Forest Service answers to stay home for two to three years. We went up there and did a self-survey in the fall of 22 and we could see with our own eyes that approximately 40,000 of the very best acres were unburned or lightly burned. And with that much good forage, staying home for two to three years did not feel like the right answer to me. I reached out to the university and I said, hey, do you think maybe this is the right time to look into this and see if we can negotiate a deal to not leave all that grass on the table? The Smiths also did not want to miss out on lucrative cattle prices in 2023 and 2024. If we would have had to sell those cattle, we would have missed the peak of the market. Turns out, the University of Idaho was eager to support the virtual fencing project. Joel Yelich, a PhD at the Nancy M. Cummings Research, Extension and Education Center in Salmon, jumped in with both feet. Not only did they have the professional staff and the knowledge base to help us get going and manage these virtual fences. They had the connections and the time and the resources to help us apply for grants and, and get funding. Uh, we would not have done it without the help of the University of Idaho. The Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management also were helpful by investing in virtual fencing base stations to assist in the project. I'd say things are going quite well. Um, after you know, following our first season, we went into it with a lot of unknowns, um, a pretty steep learning curve, and we've been able to take um, what we learned from last year and use it to uh, improve our implementation for this year. Well, I think it's going great, but when I talk to permittees that are involved in this, I'm hearing a lot of positive things. That said, virtual fencing technology has limitations currently. For example, it won't work in remote areas outside of cellular range. That rules out a lot of remote rangelands in Idaho. Ranchers who already have fenced pastures on state or federal grazing allotments won't need it. But virtual fencing would be valuable for controlling livestock in rugged areas where building fence is cost prohibitive. Let's take a moment to review the history. Who invented virtual fencing technology? How does it work? What are the benefits? Richard Peck, a traveling salesman, received the patent for inventing invisible fencing technology for pets in 1971. Dr. Dean Anderson, a range scientist, worked together with Dr. Daniela Russ, director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, to develop virtual fencing technology. Jasper Holdsworth, a New Zealand rancher who wanted to create rest rotation systems without fencing, partnered with Vents co-founder Frank Wooten to make the technology more commercially feasible. Vents provides the herd management software and base station interface technology for the virtual fencing system in Salmon. Virtual fencing systems have three basic components. A base station, typically solar powered, in a place where it can receive a strong cellular signal from an existing network. Vents GPS collars are placed on livestock. Grazing boundaries are set with Vents herd management software. To get started, it takes four to five days to train the cattle in a small pasture so they learn to respect the virtual fence boundaries. Joel Yelich explains. 
And we initially set up a barrier that is about five to 10 meters um, away from the physical fence. And then when the cows hit that virtual zone and it activates the collar, then they get a shock. The first day is strictly shock. The second day we go to a larger zone of shock, about 15, 20, that they work up against. And then the third day we go to a combination of the shock and the sound. And so they hit the sound and then they hit the shock. And so that's reinforcing, um, the sound is reinforcing that they're going to be going into a shock zone next. This video shows a mother cow responding to an audio cue and turning away from the virtual fence boundary. Only mother cows have GPS collars on them, assuming their calves will generally stay with them on the range. Yelich works with Vents technicians to set up multiple base stations on Forest Service and BLM lands to provide broad coverage in mountainous terrain. Vents technicians check on the coverage with a radio frequency scan. And so then what you try to do is figure out where you need to put enough towers to get you know, adequate coverage of your entire allotment. Turns out it takes five base stations to provide coverage of the 60,000 acre Diamond Moose allotment and BLM lands on the opposite side of the Salmon Valley. Tower operates off of what's called, it operates off a cellular signal and what they call LoRaWAN, which is a signal that's used by a lot of, of things like weather stations that can transmit a lot of data. That cellular signal is typically line of sight and it goes to the nearest tower that you have. That allows the base station to communicate with the cloud that contains all of the information that's downloaded on each cow. Then what you can do when you get into the software is we basically take our permittees and each permittee we make their cows in a herd and then each herd has a separate color. And so then the permittees can see where their specific cows are at. That's where the time savings comes in. If a rancher sees that a cow is moving out of the virtual fence pasture, they can create a second virtual fence to encourage the mother cow to move back into the pasture. If she doesn't respond correctly, the rancher knows exactly where the cow is located, shortening the trip to herd them back into the right pasture. Yes, incredible amount of time saved. Last year, it cut down my emergency rides by like 95%. Smith notes that the GPS cattle data is shared only with the producers, not the agencies. There's been some concern about the amount of scientific data that the cows collect and who gets that. And Vince only gives that data to the operators, to the ranchers. The government doesn't get it. The virtual fences only provide shock in one direction if the cows try to leave the pasture boundary. There is no shock if they return to the right pasture. The virtual fencing technology was appealing to the Smiths not only to keep their cattle in areas suitable for grazing post-fire, but they never had fences on the west side of their spring and summer range. Each year, some cows strayed from where they were supposed to be. We spent a lot of time going out and making sure those cows weren't getting in trouble. Now she's riding more for fun. I broke a horse last year. I haven't broke a horse since I was a teenager. I had time to, to do other things that weren't just going and chasing bad cows. Virtual fencing pastures have led to more even consumption of forage too. Way better. Kept all the cows exactly where they were supposed to be which was beneficial to the range in so many ways. On the lower parts of the range where we were always knocking natty cows up off of the bottom, that range got a rest and that, that grass went bonkers. The middle part of the range, which we've never really been able to substantially use because you're either fighting both ends, got cows put on it and it got grazed so it shouldn't be a fire hazard. And then the top of the mountain, that range, was huge. There was so much grass the cows couldn't hardly touch it by the time they got up there, which was beneficial to the grasslands and the range and the wildlife and all the things. Yeah. Forest Service officials agreed that range utilization improved with virtual fencing. We didn't have, you know, over utilization and we saw good distribution. Uh, things were 
things were looking good out there. Our riparian areas that were within those um, grazing units, they again, right on par with our uplands um, in good condition. Those riparian areas are even more sensitive post-fire, so being able to exclude those provided a real benefit. Virtual fencing gave the Smiths a heads up when predators or other factors spooked livestock. Watch the red dots on the screen. You can see in real time that your cows are scattering for whatever reason. One of the reasons was they did a helicopter training or something for the fighters and our cows went <laughs> Herding is still needed at times like that, but the GPS data show where to find the cattle. Knowing where they were gave us so much peace of mind. Virtual fencing does not eliminate the need for perimeter boundary fences. It's not a perimeter fence. But where it really works is all those interior fences, where you're trying to go from pasture to pasture. Virtual fence pastures also must have a water source for livestock. That's gonna dictate um, where you can put virtual fences. If you have scenarios where cows don't have any water and they know where to get water and they're fenced out, they're gonna go through the virtual fences. They gotta have water. She recommends trying virtual fencing if it might fit your operation. We were just absolutely astounded about how helpful it was and how beneficial it was for the range, for our cattle, for our workload. It just, it seems like something that would be super useful to just about anybody, however they wanted to use it. Elsewhere in the West, virtual fencing has been used to protect riparian areas, create fuel breaks, rest rotation grazing, and more, all without physical fences. Lane Justice with the Western Landowners Alliance has toured a number of virtual fencing projects and likes the results. Yeah, Jane Cheyenne have a really cool project and they've been able to use virtual fencing post-fire to still graze an area that has kind of eligible AUMs and avoid uh, burned areas and sensitive areas. And so it's really awesome. And one of the reasons they have been so successful is because they have the support from the University of Idaho to help draw the fence lines and, and um, kind of give them information in a way that makes the tool more effective and makes them, you know, helps them manage the land in a way that they do such a good job at. Overall, it's a really cool tool that can be used for just numerous things. And so I guess it's an adaptive tool that can address riparian restoration, it can address large carnivore conflict, it can address post-wildfire or new grazing techniques and tools. However, it's just still a very new technology, and so it's something that we need to make sure if we're investing in the tool um, itself, we need to also be investing in technological support to go along with it. You know, my brain just goes crazy with the amount of opportunities. Your imagination it, it is the only thing that limits it as the technology improves and the collars get better and the, and the electronics get less expensive, I think, I think we're gonna see a lot more people participating. In terms of costs, the Smiths say it's worth the money to invest in the GPS collars at $50 each, but it definitely helps to find grants for the cost of the base stations. Most ranchers could not afford to shoulder the $10,000 cost of base stations alone, especially if several are required. We're very fortunate that we were part of a pilot project and we got some grants and made this more affordable. And then hopefully our data and our usage makes it more popular, makes the cost go down, makes the product better. That's definitely our goal is to, in being pioneers in this, is to help it benefit more people in the future.